Okay, great. Yeah. Dear everybody, welcome to our third keynote today. And it's my honor and pleasure to give a few introductory words about our keynote speaker, Arisaka Yoko, today. Yoko Arisaka is born in Kamakura, and she went to the US in 1980 in her 12th grade. Um, she has a degree in art, in a bachelor and a master, and received a PhD in philosophy at the UC Riverside in 1996. Her dissertation is on Heidegger, Nishida, and Watsuji. In, from 1996 to 2007, she was Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of San Francisco. Um, she went to Germany in 2005. Then to her research activities, she was in 1997, she was CNRS researcher in Paris at the EHESS with Austin Berg. And after that, she was adjunct at Kobe University in 2002. And in 2009, she was adjunct professor at the University of Hildesheim, or since, yeah, since. <clears throat> um, from 2009 to 2011, she was fellow at the Research Institute for Philosophy in Hannover. Her recent publications in 2013, together with Rolf Elberfeld, co-edited the uh, Nishida Kitaro in der Philosophie des 20. Jahrhunderts, and 2014, the German intro of Cornel West. Then forthcoming is a co-edited um, volume together with Matsumaru Hisao. It's the Tetsugaku Companion to Nishida Kitaro and published by Springer next year, maybe? Yeah. Ne hopefully next year. Yeah. We don't know yet. OK. Um, then recent articles are, for example, in the Oxford Handbook of Japanese Philosophy, edited by Brett Davis and others, uh, Controversies in Japanese Philosophy in 2013. Yeah, <clears throat> I think... Hmm? 17. Okay, oh, sorry, 2017. Yeah, I think now it's time to give a warm welcome to our today's keynote speaker, Ari Sakayoko. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the nice um, introduction. Uh, I don't have to uh, here. Okay, yeah, yeah. And um, thank you so much for Garrett for organizing this whole, um, to start in this uh, network. It's grown and it's wonderful, yeah. And I have tremendously enjoyed the papers. And uh, yeah, I think that's taking off. It's great, but yeah. Me alone. Yeah, I know, yeah. but it's, uh, yeah, for the group. And this time, the organizers, you guys have done so much, so thank you very much. Yeah, Yukiko-san and Leon-san, and where's uh, Francesca? Ah, wait a minute, where, where's Francesca? She's still organizing. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> you see, it's always, you know, be, behind, the, behind the scene, it's a lot of organization, yeah. And then, especially dealing with the philosophers who are like, come, yeah, chaotic. So thanks for doing a great job. Transitions. We live in the world of rapid and complex transitions of all kinds, personal to the global, technical and cultural. We adapt to the constantly changing environment. We are necessarily involved. We have no choice but to live the transitions that are everywhere upon us. In such a world, there is actually an insight, I believe, that we could still learn from Nishida. I have to admit that for the last several years, I have mostly been doing political philosophy in a contemporary context, um, namely feminism and racism. That's sort of my field. Um, and I get asked many times, um, so why uh, are you doing Nishida too? Uh, what's the relevance today? Um, so moving away from the usual political discussions that I get myself involved with, um, even re with respect to Nishida, I'm often in these political discussions with respect to Nishida. Um, today I want to discuss one possible way um, to interpret Nishida's lifelong insight, if you will, yeah? from the theory of pure experience to the last writings. For those of you who are Nishida specialists, there are a lot of you who are Nishida spe specialists, what I will say is nothing really 
probably new. Um, so you can say, yeah, okay, I can see that. Mm -hmm, okay, yeah. Those who, those of you who are not familiar with Nishida, um, maybe there's uh, one way to sort of get an idea. Okay, that can be what Nishida is about. Yeah, okay, I can see that. Yeah. So. Um, I hope that um, some sense of a Nishida will come through at the end. Yeah. And um, also why I think Nishida is interesting still today. Yeah. And beyond the sort of historical insignificance or sort of intellectual history, um, why Nishida has a place. Yeah. So philosophically speaking, I think there is some insight that is worth still noticing. What might be some of the insights from Nishida that might still be relevant in today's changing context? In order to answer this question, I discuss um, three things. So the philosophical insights of Nishida that refer to our current selves. I trace what might be called the first person standpoint in Nishida's um, theory throughout, <coughs> with a particular focus on the notion of the eternal present. And, at the same time, the dialectical, dialectical historical theory of Nishida, uh, which are helpful, I think, in thinking about a place in the world today. And then I will try to combine the two at the end and talk about our place in the whole thing. Yeah? So first, the first person approach. I introduced this first person, third person as um, sort of like a heuristic, yeah? It's, it's sort of an analytic tool to try and get to what I think um, Anishida's insight might be. As with many historical figures in philosophy, there are many ways to tease out a theme or a strand of interpretation to highlight an idea or insight of a philosopher in order to shed a light on a particular theoretical focus. Nishida is no exception. There's like 19 or 20 volumes of the, um, um, the Zenshu, and then people go through these and trying to figure out, okay, how can I tell a coherent theoretical story? So my attempt is one, one such uh, attempt, yeah? Um, the conventional interpretation among Nishida scholars regarding the development of Nishida's corpus as a whole is to read the early theory of pure experience as rather psychologistic, and that Nishida subsequently tried to avoid the psychologism and subjectivism and develop a more um, elaborate uh, theory of the will, uh, following Fichte, as pure act of the Tathandlung. After I learned German, I thought, Tathandlung, yeah, that's great. That, that's sort of like the double word, yeah? which later became systematically developed as his uh, logic of place as absolute nothingness. And in order then to avoid a misinterpretation as empty kind of a metaphysics and to give more historical significance, and there he followed um, people like Hegel and Marx, Nishida simultaneously emphasized his theory of place as the self-determination of the dialectical universal that concretely involves historical subjects and their concrete actions. Agents acting through active intuition. That's one of those terms that are often discussed. In this line of accepted interpretation, one could perhaps discern a shift from the earlier first person standpoint to the later um, sort of a more theoretical third person like uh, way, uh, um, ways of doing metaphysics in Nishida, um, especially in the metaphysics of place or the dialectical universal. Yeah. More, more from a theoretical standpoint of the philosopher. The standpoint of the first person self becomes integrated in the system, in, in this uh, historical self, like as if you see these uh, self of the earlier theory as one of these um, uh, working elements in this historical development. Yeah? So that's what I mean. The first um, early part, he, you, uh, you, you focus more on the, uh, the first person um, uh, entry into the world, but somehow later you see Nishida's theory from a third person perspective and then uh, see the historical development, if you will. Yeah? But the theoretical standpoint that sees the self and the dialectical, dialectical system is often interpreted as being no longer the first person standpoint of a pure experience. But I want to show in this paper, Nishida never left that initial insight. 
Yeah? So um, I want to follow the earlier insight throughout to the end. But um, before I go into this, let me clarify my use of the term first person um, versus the third person. There's also the second person, but um, I'm not going to go into the second person in detail today. There are, in fact, two ways in which the first person perspective can be understood. The first is the seeing self. And that is sometimes Nishida calls it the noetic eye that cannot itself be an object. This is what I mean by the first person. When I use first person, sometimes I have to say first first person to make um, that distinction. Um, throughout this paper, when I say first person, most likely I mean this seer without the, uh, the scene, yeah? the seeing without the scene. <coughs> but most often, and to some extent unavoidable in writing, um, is to grasp the first person perspective in the third person. That is to say, first person becomes an object. That is to see the first person as a, an object of analysis, of reflection, um, or theory. Such a first pers person perspective is seen from the, um, uh, the sort of above mentioned, the seeing self, yeah? So the first first person perspective. So this seeing first person is ordinarily what is understood as the self's perspective in psychology, um, consciousness studies, uh, theory of mind, uh, and even in theories of pure experience as we try to analyze Nishida's theory of pure experience most often. Yeah? And usually it means things like sensations, inner states, um, contents of consciousness, um, thought, reflection, um, and the like. But that's not what I mean by the first person. Uh, it's not the self. So let me say what I mean by the third person then. Um, it's the assumed perspective of the theorist in the natural and social sciences, um, traditional philosophy, and often in, uh, in reading uh, Nishida. Yeah? In philosophy, there's sometimes uh, called, um, this perspective is sometimes called the bird's eye perspective, or the view from nowhere, or the God's eye view. It is in itself unthematized, but its standpoint presumes to see the whole, yeah? the whole of history, the whole of metaphysics, the, 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 the view from nowhere that tries to grasp the whole. Yeah? When we analyze the standpoint of pure experience, for instance, we necessarily take this uh, third person perspective and project the contents of um, and operations of pure experience sometimes as the object of analysis. And in a way, that's not avoidable yeah? when we read uh, books and when we try to read theory. Uh, so the first person becomes uh, sort of doubled. Yeah? Um, but what I mean by the first person uh, first person is the embodied act of reading, the projected first person as an object. Normally, this first person project, uh, person is the uh, the invisible um, seeing, invisible to itself. I won't discuss it today, as I said. But the second person is the standpoint of a Tao, um, which uh, we have heard from uh, several papers, and in, including um, Uehara-san's paper, no? the, the Tao that is not the relational self to another relation seen from the third person perspective, about the, uh, the Tao that comes to you and speaks to you. Yeah? So you have to um, receive that encounter. That will be the second person. So let me tease out an alternative line of interpretation in reading Nishida, one which sustains the first person uh, stands throughout. Yeah? Again, by the first person, I do not mean a psychological standpoint focusing on the, on the subjective contents of a self, such as sensations and perceptions. This first person signifies a concrete perspectival center, if you will. See, it's not a self as a thing, but it's the act of seeing. Yeah? That cannot be um, an object. The theory of pure experience is a first-person theory insofar as one begins from the simple fact of immediate experience. 
prior to the establishment of the subject and object, in Nishida's words, in the immediate experience, there is not yet a dis discussion, uh, distinction of subject and object. Um, sorry to repeat this familiar story, but for the story, I will go through this. So, um, it's often misunderstood as a version of psychologism, as Nishida himself admits. But if pure experience is prior to the subject-object distinction, it cannot refer to the psychological contents of, or the consciousness of the pre presupposed subject. It is, there, there is no presupposed subject to which you can assign inner states or immediate experience. Yeah? The theory of pure experience is rather something then like an experiential ontology, yeah? a new kind of ontology based on the immediacy of the, uh, the, self, of the self simultaneously opening up to the world, perhaps uh, not unlike uh, Heidegger's Dasein as being in the world. See, Dasein as being in the world, that's also not a psychological self. Yeah, but, but it retains some sense of the first personness and entry into the, uh, the world and the ontology in some robust sense. Yeah. Um, reality in this field of experience that is prior to the individuation of experiences belonging to uh, persons as such, it's not a psychological notion, but rather an ontological field or the ground yeah, that contains in it itself the principles that... Um, define what would be subsequently analyzable as subjective or objective. Thus, according to Nishida, the famous uh, quote, I quote, it is not that the individual has experience, but in experience emerges the individual. The individual, is, individual experience is only a, smart, a small part of experience, unquote. I want to argue that even in his abstract logic of place or his theory of the dialectical universal, this first personness never disappeared. Nishida himself writes in his third preface to an inquiry into the good. The inquiry into the good was originally published in 1911, but he wrote to the, as a third preface in 1936. That's also a often quoted and very much known um, preface, but I'll read it. Seen from today's perspective, I have to say I'm a bad translator. So uh, um, you can say, well, that's not a good translation. I, I, I have to fully admit and apologize. Yeah. I understand the con con uh, con uh, content, but I'm often uh, very bad at translation. Seen from today's perspective, the standpoint of this book may be considered that of consciousness, and it is rather psychologistic. It's understandable, but it might be criticized as such. However, even as I wrote this book, my ideas were not simply those of consciousness. The standpoint of pure experience became that of absolute will through the influence of Fichte's notion of Tathandlung in intuition and reflection in self-awareness. That was uh, 1917 which in turn went through another transformation and turned into the standpoint of place mediated by Greek philosophy in the later half of from that which acts to that which sees. That was, um, what is it, 1927 or something along those lines. That was my attempt to systematize my thinking. The philosophy of place then became concretized as the dialectical universal, and this standpoint became again immediate as the standpoint of act acting action intuition. What has been discussed in this book, that's um, the inquiry into the good, the world of immediate experience or pure experience is now understood as the historical reality. Thus, the world of action intuition, the world of poesis is actually no other than the world of pure experience. So he returns at the end to um, the pure experience and say, yeah, he went through these uh, different uh, renditions but um, my insight has never left. As this quote indicates, throughout the systematization attempts, Nishida never abandoned the initial insight of his, his early theory of pure experience, even in his later metaphysically more robust um, um, theories. It's therefore not an incoherent line of interpretation, I hope, to follow the, in, uh, the development of the initial first-person perspective, even in later theories. 
In order to follow this line of interpretation, another key concept I want to now introduce, I find it helpful, is the notion of the eternal present, at times also called the absolute present. The term began to appear sporadically after the early 1930s, and um, it just um, appears after that uh, quite often. The eternal present is the here and now. Yeah? Here and now, that, I quote, simultaneously unifies the past and the future. It is the present at the center that determines a world, unquote. The past, present, and future, they are not on a timeline, as it were, but the determinations or the expressions of the here and now, the eternal present, which are simultaneously both the past and the future. Um, for instance, he says, the absolute present that determines temporality. One can consider this as the self-determination of the absolute nothingness with multiple centers and without borders. See, here and now, yeah? it's like a um, now, yeah? that doesn't have the, the borders or the edge, but here, it, it's, uh, it determines the past and the future in its present renditions, yeah, if you will. In this sense, the absolute present can begin anywhere and instantly gathers infinite past and future at the point of the present. Such is the eternal present. Time is established through the self-determination of the eternal present. What is interesting, I think, um, is the next step. Nishida connects the I, the first person, to this eternal present through our actions. So our actions become the, um, the mediating point to this uh, eternal present, us. Yeah? And the next step, then both actions, our actions, and the self, the first person self, and the eternal present, that becomes identified with the self-determination of the absolute nothingness. Yeah? So to quote, so these are the sort of successive ways in which um, these things get connected. The moment the content of the eternal present gets intuitively determined, there is the I, or the jiko, yeah? The self as the I. The content of the true self is no other than the content of the eternal present. The outside becomes the inside. Our world does not flow from the past to the future. The past flows into the present and the future to the present as well. Our world flows from the present to the present. And that is the I, yeah? the eternal present. That the present determines, determines itself to be the past or the future, the self-determination of the eternal present, that a world is determined as the present at its center. So it, it's the centerness that you have to retain in the here and the now. All this means that we act. So I think that's, uh, it's, it's great. So it's the action, yeah? So the, the immediateness, immediateness of the self is expressed through the actions and not mind's consciousness or the, uh, or, or the, the self thought of as the, uh, some kind of a floating thing. But we, and in a way, it's true, right? Um, our conceptual analysis come to a stop. But when we act, that is the most immediate thing, yeah? We are brought to the here and now, yeah? All this that means that we act, okay. Through actions, we are constantly in touch with the eternal present. Our actions always arise from it. What is considered the self-determination of the eternal present is the self-determination of absolute nothingness. So it's surprisingly, the I, the here and now, the eternal present is the self-determination of absolute nothingness. If you are Nishida scholar, it's not surprising. You know this already. Yeah? As the universal place itself. This is the true meaning of intuition. Actions can be thought of as that which unifies the irrational, as the self-determination of the eternal present. At the same time, this is the self seeing itself, as the now determines itself. Yeah? So it's this immediate intuition that expresses itself in actions, but actions can also be thought. Yeah? We, we think, and that's one way in which we um, act. 
The self as the I, the seeing or the acting self, this is the noetic self, the, uh, the first, first person that cannot be seen, yeah? Um, the I as the object. Um, that's not what it is, but the I as the subject, subject. is identified as the dynamic eternal present. Nishida sometimes describes this um, noetic I as located at the center of the circle without circumference. See, if you flip through the, uh, the, this period of Nishida, he wrote a bunch of uh, diagrams, and there's always this uh, um, circle, but the, the, the circumference is not there. It's like our experience in the here and now. We are the, the, the focal point, yeah? So we have a world, but it's, you can't, it's, it, there's no end to the circle, yeah? So in time and space-wise, both. So if one follows Nishida's intuition, or perhaps if you are already familiar with the, uh, the Mahayana tradition of uh, Sunyata, one can certainly see the development from his earlier theory of pure experience expressed in another articulation. The immediacy of the here and now <coughs> is the moment of seeing without the, without the subject and object prior to reflection, the field of pure experience. It's this ongoing here and now, the eternal present, which unifies reality as it appears, and the seeing self, yeah? is always at its center, as it were. But this I as the seer is not mere consciousness, as I have said already. It's an embodied self, as uh, Leon explained it in his uh, embodied uh, phenomenology. Yeah? A series of actions which are embedded in history, dialectically interacting and co-creating at all times. Precisely through this process of dialectical determinations are of our embodied selves, our present is the lived present, the eternal present being constantly born. And this, the whole dialectical world, that is the eternal present, is the self-determination of absolute nothingness or, or the place. Um, then you say, yeah, but I still don't get it. Why is that nothing when it's everything? Yeah? Um, if this is so, the self-determination of absolute nothingness is not some mysterious metaphysical occurrence, um, but it is happening right now. Yeah, it's happening right now through our very embodied selves at all times. In Nishida's words, I quote, that which is truly concrete existence, which is the self-determination of the absolute nothingness, is our individual selves as the self-determination of the eternal now. So, so far I have traced um, pure experience to the self, to the eternal now, to the here and now center to the, that is the expression of the, uh, the self-determination of nothingness, and that is the, um, the dialectical historical world that is supposed to be the concrete universal. Yeah? Um, so here lies Nishida's novelty, and in my view, the most interesting idea that makes his uh, philosophy relevant today. In analyzing Nishida's corpus as a whole, the development of his theory from the so-called psychologistic theory of pure experience to the more systematic and ontological theory of place, to the more historical and dialectical theory of the acting self, could be read as the development from the first person to the third person, perhaps. Um, but in fact, if one understands the first person as the first first person in, in this way that I articulated, then, um, this perspective never left Nishida throughout um, his uh, lifelong theory. But the story goes further. Even when, man, even when one necessarily takes the third person perspective and read and analyze Nishida, for instance, when we read and analyze the self-determination of absolute nothingness or the self-determination of the self as eternal present, and thereby projecting this whole theory as an object of analysis, the first first person is always at hand in the act of reading and thinking. In fact, that's the real subject. Yeah? That's the real subject of reality at all times, the unfolding of the eternal present right now. And that's as you hear my voice right now.
So that's how you notice the here and now in your embodiment. You think, oh God, I got shift in my chair, why is there nothing up there, is there a mistake? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, here and now, yeah? That constantly escapes us because we are not present, because we are so totally focused on what should be up there. Did she forget? Is there a mistake? Uh -huh -huh. Yeah, and then um, what's that about? See, that's how we focus, yeah, an object, yeah? And then this presence that is the here and now, that is yourself in your body. That is the dimension that is necessarily escapes the theory because it's not about the theory. But I think that's what Nishida wants to talk about. Yeah? It's not in the book. So this first first person, you right now, yeah, turns out to be the ineliminable field in which all that is to be seen, thought, acted upon takes place. In short, what Nishida sometimes means, the whole of reality, yeah? the ground. You are the ground, here and now. And as we know, it is what Nishida has been referring to, yeah? but the reference is not the content, but to our present self, as you are sitting here right now, yeah? and listening and thinking the actual here and now. But so far as I know, um, there is no philosophical theory that tries to thematize and systematize this unfolding here and now, in a way because it's not possible. Yeah? But it's indirectly referable, perhaps, yeah? that of ourselves at this very moment. But I think yeah, this is what Nishida's theory tries to articulate or tries to indirectly express, yeah? in a trite way, that's the Zen element in Nishida. Yeah? Through, and then, although he himself never hardly ever refers to Mahayana Buddhism, or maybe in the last writings he does. Yeah? Thus, it turns out that the content of Nishida's theory is necessarily not theoretically graspable, but it is ubiquitous, ubiquitously available if we simply stop and shift our ways of being, ways of being present. Without turning such reflection into an object of a reflection, there is a way to um, live it, perhaps, yeah? Moreover, if this is true, then what Nishida refers to is not his theory, his writings, what happened in history, or even the theory of absolute nothingness in his corpus or his time is rather the living present, our embodied presence in the here and now, and that's what I mean, 2018, yeah, 8th of September at 10 minutes after four, yeah, and beyond. This is why Nishida's theory is necessarily relevant today. He is still speaking to us. In fact, it, it refers to a very present moment as we live and we are called upon to become aware of this fact. The, focus, nee, the force of Nishida's theory in this sense lies in our taking full account of the living present. We read, discuss, and analyze Nishida and his entire theory as content. But in fact, the very content is not what Nishida writes, but our here and now, yeah, as it unfolds. Um, regardless of the content, really. Yeah. So we, in fact, constantly already enact what Nishida calls the self-identity of absolute contradictory opposites. Yeah. Of pure nothingness out of which everything becomes what they are. And the simultaneous contents of our, of our reality at this very moment. Keeping this point in mind, let me now turn to the second issue, and that is, of the, his, that is the historical content and um, the histori history and, and the dialectical world. From the mid to late 1930s, Nishida began to develop his theory in a much more concrete framework. The abstract theory of the logic of place as, as absolute nothingness in the late 1920s acquired a distinctively historical content influenced by Hegel and Marx's dialectic. The historical development um, 
quad self-development of place as absolute nothingness takes place through what Nishida calls action intuition. Um, it, koi takes chokkan, the koi means actions, and a chokkan is intuition. It's the kind of action that um, is um, immediate in the sense of unreflective, but nevertheless concrete. And it has this um, 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 uh, aspect of um, reaction and action at the same time that makes up who we are self throughout. Historical development is to be understood as the dialectic of the subject making the world, the object, which in turn forms the subject. The original insight from the theory of pure experience, that of the experiential field that is supposed to develop into subject and object, is now historicized and concretized through dialectical <coughs> action. The historical subject negates or transcends itself in its becoming the historical environment, which at the same time negates the environment to become itself again. So similar process occurs among the historical agents that we are in our history. So history is that which we make and through which that we are made. And that is this uh, dialectical uh, development. In his political writings, the process of the acting dialectical self and its co-determination with the environment gets applied to the relation among nations. For instance, in the principle of the new world order, the metaphysical dialectical theory of his historical world which posits all entities to be mediated through the process of historical action, creation, mediation, the dialectical process, was applied to the theory of the age of the self-realization of the world through nation building. So every nation, in order to establish itself, would do so through a negation of itself in the recognition of others, other, and the difference, as well as a negation of the other to um, establish itself as the other of the other. And through this dialectic, each nation affirms itself in relation to others. So it's inherent to this process of recognition that the other is an other to me and the other is the other of the other. In this process, the particularities of cultures are preserved and the essential interdependence of nations are, um, is recognized. Through this process on a global scale, the realization of the global world, sekai teki sekai, is achieved. See, in, in reading a theory like that, notice how easy it is at this point to slip into the third person perspective and see the acting self or the see the formation of nations um, interacting and co-creating the historical world. Yeah? Reading Nishida's historical theory requires this theoretical third person standpoint um, from which the development of history and, and the dialectical world can be grasped. The acting self becomes seen from a view from nowhere as it were as one of the essential elements in this historical process. But as mentioned above, the first first person perspective is only hidden. Yeah, why? Well, because you are thematizing this whole thing. So it's unthematized, but it's a necessary ground for which the whole thing is uh, seen. So um, the third person perspective is actually not a view from nowhere. It is actually the first first person. Yeah? It is there at all. Um, at all times. In a highly multifaceted world today, such a, such a dialectical theory of identity formation is not only applicable, but also helpful in negotiating multi-layered relations among groups, be it nations, cultural subgroups, political identities. And identity formation necessarily involves a recognition of the other as well as itself as the other of the other. And it's here that the power negotiations occur in this political uh, development. Nishida's political context at the time was the rise of um, Asian solidarity against the encroaching Euro-American imperialism during the Pacific War. But the si same dialectical theoretical framework could be used to discuss today's problems of multiculturalism, 
intercultural dialogue and global diversity issues, um, as discussed by recent uh, Nishida scholars such as um, Brett Davis, or John Moraldo, and Gary Onkopf. To put it all together, how does responsibility get into this? Um, let me now put the two discussions together. Nishida's um, ontology stipulates that the content of his theory is no theory at all, but rather our lived present that can never be turned into an object as such. It can be analyzed and systematized <coughs> as if it were an object, as Nishida attempts. But what he refers to are the immediate actions that we are constantly involved with. And that is immersed in our surroundings, even in the act of thinking or reflection. It refers to the non-objectifiable now, that is the I myself at all times, as you are sitting right now in this room. The here and now, not just here and now as we read it, but here and now, I mean here and now. Yeah? Next, this field of experience that is the here and now, as it were, has the dialectical structure that continuously makes the self and its world. So whether you like it or not, you are in this process. And perhaps similar to Heidegger's being in the world, um, the existential opening unfolds the world through our involvement. The eternal present is already an ongoing field that unifies all these elements. The self, that is the I, in this process is not simply a thing among other things, but it is a creative self that interacts and um, what it does then matters in the immediate appropriation of the future um, to the enaction of the present, to the making of the past. To put it in the first person language, what I think and, um, what I think and do actually make a difference in terms of what kind of per, uh, personal interactions, futures, immediate and far, and the personal history I create. To the extent I am constantly involved with others in this ongoing process, I am a co-maker of history with others. And I can make decisions this way or that way, and that makes a difference in terms of outcome, however small. If this is the case, then the responsibilities for the decisions and interactions are also an inalienable aspect of this I. Yeah? We, we are not automatons, yeah? simply determined by history. We are creative and we determine history. And that process we are going to be held responsible for. Yeah? Um, I can orient myself according to my view of the world, and I can inform myself about this process. I can develop moral sensibilities. Hear the call of a thou, as others are also not person things, no? but they are a thou. They, call, they speak to us. Yeah? And then in our presence, we hear them speak. Or feel empathy toward others, learn about ethics, Think about uh, a gentler society or the world with less suffering. I can, of course, do all of the opposite. I can think that I'm going to treat you like a thing. That happens all the time. But um, the process, nevertheless, is the same, and the responsibilities follow us. Such decisions may appear to come in the near future as if it's on a linear process but it's in fact actually the here and now that we uh, drag and postpone and sort of retract and then try to mend and then go another step and so on and so forth. I could say to myself, well, but it doesn't really make a difference in the end. And while that may be completely true, this is still a decision and a stance one is committed to. Yeah? I can dwell in the past, whatever this may entail, personal or historical, but that, too, is an on ongoing unfolding of the here and now that I have committed myself to. In this way, I am rather an agent who deliberates and contemplates the actions, um, even through some of this uh, deliberation and contemplation, may not be at the conscious level. We are still involved in this process 
think of their, their, their uh, potential for therapy. It's like a Nishida therapy center yeah? <laughs> in the eternal now. It's like you're stuck in the past. Uh, not really. Yeah? Your future is the now. Mm. So you are an agent in the present moment with all of your past and future together. Yeah? The historical world of such agents, personalities, he calls it, Nishida calls it. And that's why for Nishida, morality um, too belongs to this fundamental reality. That's not separate. Yeah? So the responsibility is connected with decisions. And since we are making and made environment, the sense of our responsibilities is always relational for the other and for the larger context. And it's a part and parcel part of the here and now as we act. Yeah? It's not like we have this acting self and uh, um, relationships and responsibilities are added on. Nay, we are from the beginning responsible. From the first person perspective, since my decisions are situated and implicated in the concrete process of history, my dialectical involvement with others and with the wider envir environment is always already moral and political. In this sense, history does not just happen um, yeah, in the third person, but rather it is dialectically created through its particulars. And our decisions, actions, projections, reflections, interpretations, narrations, moral sensibilities, compassion, understanding, will or lack of will, freedom or pretend no freedom, um, all that. Yeah? From the first person perspective, Nishida's theory highlights this existential dimension in the dialectical historical process. And such a dimension inclu includes us today. Yeah? So history is also what we do in the sense. Pure experience and action intuition, the dialectical universal and its self-determination are not in books or in Nishida's philosophy or the volume seven of the Nishida Kitaro Zenshu, or in the footnote of the Philosophical Essays, volume two, page 23, yeah? True as it may be, yeah? They are still very much an articulation of the very process in which we live, yeah? Theorize and communicate here and now. As Jim Heisek and others have called out, Nishida scholarship must open itself up to the world and uh, be a living part of our contemporary engagement. I think that's true. Yeah? We continue a living tradition, a concrete universal in the process of unfolding. In our current context, Nishida reminds us of the role and place of the I that is embedded in the here and now. The eternal present unfolds, and along with it, the legacy of Nishida that we carry out in our very actions. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you so much, Yoko, for this um, profound and inspiring talk. And we have now half an hour for, yeah, for questions and comments. And please, if you have a comment, try to condense it to, like, <laughs> let's say, two or three minutes. Think about the others. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, Brad. Okay. I better start the stopwatch. Thank you very much, Yoko. Don't count this on the time. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. That was um, uh, really excellent. And uh, you, in connecting your own work, with the two sides of your own work, uh, I think you also really show a path from Nishida to uh, engagement. And the other kind of work that you do, and that we all should be. See, you have to realize a compliment from Red Davis. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I feel like my personality has been insulted, but <laughs> I usually don't give compliments. Um, okay, now I'll show the other side of my personality. Yeah, good. <laughs> That's also good. Yeah. So I, I have one uh, really, it's a small uh, point, it's really a terminological point. But I want to show why it makes a big difference. Yeah. And the difference it makes 
uh, is not, uh, is totally agreeing with you. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. The difference in Mexico, <coughs> maybe, I think, maybe just helps us think along yeah. with you. And the, the terminological point is, although it makes for a less uh, nice title, I think really it's taking responsibility as the self-determination of the eternal presence. Yeah, yeah. And so I think it's important to distinguish between a noima, yeah. the eternal present, and a noima the jiko de gente. Yeah, okay, yeah. And so the, the present of our experience that you draw our attention to, yeah. I think is not the eternal <laughs> present as such. It's the self-determination of the eternal present. Yeah. And the yeah. reason why that makes a difference and why it will be very bolster what you're doing is because I think <coughs> the difference there is opening the imminent transcendence yeah. that opens our first-person experience to alterity. Yeah. Because it's the fact that our, our present experience is a self-determination of the eternal present is the expression of that imminent transcendence. Mm. And so that's, I really agree with the way you trace from pure experience to the, the first person, and it's still there in the later work. <coughs> but I think it's still there with the addition of this opening to alterity mm. at the very bottom of the self itself. Mm -hmm. the, so the first person perspective then opens us to the second person perspective, mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. and third person perspective, mm -hmm. So I think that's what you're doing is really interesting in terms of Nishida scholarship because in tracing the first person perspective through, we also show how he, and this is what I don't know anyone has done as well as Nishida and you, you show this, is that the first, we don't have to leave the first person perspective to open to the second and, and, and the third. Yeah, uh, that must be the ground, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, that's uh, <coughs> that's great. Yeah. Did I, did I no, no, yeah, but that's uh, that, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> See, that's how Nishida scholars talk, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's uh, that's really good, and that really shows then, really the development. The pure experience theory was, in that sense, still undeveloped, and that is true. Yeah, these dimensions come, yeah, in later. Yeah, and also the. Uh, Determination of the eternal present is also good because um, when we have to understand it, then necessarily it is the noematic meaning element that has to be included. Yeah. So in the determination, it's like a double um, movement, but the determined things must be comprehended. Yeah, as the ground for the uh, and the opening to the, um, the the absolute alterity in the. Uh, self-determination of the eternal present. That's also very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a question from outside, and I'm yeah. part of the second group. Yeah. And I'm not uh, inside Michigan, yeah? yeah? You know it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But we're in the other group as the insider. <laughs> yeah. And um, I think from my outside perspective, immediacy is a very important concept, mm -hmm. but a very difficult one, yeah. but a necessary one, yeah. but a very difficult one. And I think uh, what you showed in the last part um, uh, made it clear that it's, it's, uh, it's a wrong way to articulate immediacy uh, in, a, in a style that you are um, working with strong oppositions. Immediacy yeah. see in opposition to history, sociological yeah, 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 yeah. So, so this is a very important point, I think, and, but it makes up the question how to articulate the immediacy. The, the, yeah, the immediacy, and whether immediacy is empty or full. Yeah, and huh? I, I have, a, I have a, um, a, I'm a little bit suspicious about two of your suggestions of articulation of immediacy. Mm -hmm. yeah? uh, the first, first perspective, mm -hmm. first perspective, I, and, the, and the here and now. Mm -hmm. And my suspicions are from, for, uh, concerning the first suggestion, the first, first, first mm -hmm. perspective, that it is too much. Uh, uh, underlining the opposition to the second and the third person. Mm -hmm. okay. In this concept is this mm -hmm. opposition too much inside. Yeah? Okay, yeah. If you want to underline or to make clear in this immediacy the processuality, the involvement yeah. and the concreteness, yeah. you can articulate, articulate it with these concepts directly. Yeah. And uh, the second suspicion towards uh, the here and now, yeah. when you explain it, or also with the empty um, Empty uh, yeah. thing. Yeah. Uh, I I uh, I found it very interesting, but you made it in a in a way where you are uh, working with a, a, um, 
appeal, yeah, with an appeal and to, and it was uh, here and now it has a punctuality. Yeah. You say here, now, and you, yeah, it was uh, a little bit like a priest, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I then, but I found it more interesting that the here and now, or this dimension of immediacy, mm -hmm. is showing up in uh, experiences of irritation. It was an experience of irritation, mm -hmm. not now, here, yeah, remember, remember, mm -hmm. but more in irritation and from a pragmatist point of view in habits. Uh -huh. yeah? And then change. Uh huh. That's interesting. Yeah. 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 Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not really sure. It's the point of uh, irritation. I mean, I think it's a point of uh, joy as well. Now. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So maybe it's this particular articulation. Yeah. Yeah. But because I think it's the qu qualitatively um, uh, doesn't have to be uh, negative. So. Yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah, 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 and also it's not empty, yeah. So that, uh, yeah, so that um, it it could um, show up in uh, togetherness. Uh, yeah, maybe the uh, examples were kind of uh, negative. Yeah, I'm not sure, but certainly um, the moment of togetherness or a mutual understanding, uh, it's all there as well. Yeah. And then it's um, the thou becomes perhaps important in the um, when it involves uh, not not uh, an object of reflection but um, other people. Yeah. 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 Thanks. That's interesting. Yeah. How about the first question? Uh, so the uh, what was the first first? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, see, that is an analytical tool. It's not a clear and ontological di distinction. Yeah. So it's like a from the beginning, the whole thing is one, as it were. Yeah. So then it, it's um, it's an analytical tool to focus on this aspect of the whole, as opposed to that aspect of the whole, as opposed to that aspect of the whole. But they are not distinct in a way. Yeah. Because in order to make sense of the seeing self. The first first person, of course, uh, the uh, the object to that first person person has to be there in order for that to make sense. So from the beginning, the reciprocal relation and the the the, the connection is already the ground from from which the distinction can be articulated, perhaps. Yeah. So the second and the third persons are somehow um, there from the beginning to the end. Yeah. So that sometimes, I think this is kind of the weakness and also the strength of Nishida that you don't know if he talks about how it is or mm. how it should be. Or yeah, okay. Mm. If, the, if it's the De na kereba naranai. historical world or an ideal world. But I think there's also like in this, uh, in this ambiguity, there could be somehow the, the, um, the seed for thinking about how um, empowerment or something, something like uh, to think about power, because I think um, this historical world is very much connected to power relations. And to think about what power is for, for Nishida, and I think this is um, something that's very at the center of this later philosophy, is this uh, contradictoriness, or um, mm -hmm. the, the unity of, of self-contradictory unity. And I think this is something like the fuel or um, of the whole um, agency and the trans transformation in how he thinks the historical world is the self-contradictoriness, yeah. and how, uh, maybe it's also connected to what Brett said, like the inclusion of the other, or the inclusion of that which cannot be included. So the, the, the self-contradictory unity is, is a unity of something that cannot be united. Mm -hmm. And this, mm -hmm. um, like this, uh, it cannot be included, um, but you have to include it. Kind of. mm -hmm. This thing is for me something which is uh, very close to something like an appeal of Nishida to, to try to create a world in which this unincludable is included. And maybe it's also what you talk about, like a theory which includes the non-theoretical the, the non mm -hmm. or the, that, that which cannot be theorized. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can say something about this because I think that there might be some, um, 
some future possibilities for Nishida. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Research there. On the power relation, that's a difficult one for Nishida, yeah? Mm -hmm. Um, as I said, I work a lot in political philosophy, and over and over and over, I want to somehow use Nishida, but um, power <coughs> relations are somehow um, hard to generate out of Nishida, <laughs> yeah, for various reasons. I'm not going to go into this right now. Um, it, and I think um, Nishida's students who are sort of robustly uh, Marxist, they were sort of dissatisfied with Nishida, and I, I think uh, for a good reason. Um, power critique, um, you have to um, really understand the perspective of the disenfranchised, yeah? And Nishida's whole ontology, what, what I have explained, it's still from the position of power, um, position of the powerful theorist, I have to say, yeah, after a long uh, considerations on this issue. So, um, that's in a way why in my other um, political work, Nishida does not appear so much. Yeah, because I haven't <laughs> figured out the way to deal with this power problem. But um, what, what, you think about, uh, what you say about the negation, um, inclusion of the negation, that's I think completely true in Nishida. And that's the difference between um, sort of like a closed uh, dialectic and the open dialectic like Nishida, the absolute negation, the absolute alterity um, can be um, a moment as the absolute other that cannot be incorporated um, in the theory. Yeah? And that's the absolute, um, the unity of absolute contradiction yeah? Yeah. in a way. The, the, what, what he calls sometimes the irrational, that has to be um, there. Um, I'm not sure if I'm making any sense. There is a sense in which your enemy, let's say, um, for the enemy to be an enemy, there must be an element in that enemyness to you that must absolutely oppose you, yeah? And that cannot be um, an oppose you as your enemy, but somehow absolutely oppose you. Otherwise, it's not the enemy, yeah? And um, there must be a use for this kind of a um, contradictory um, negation that's um, in Nishida that's uh, discussable. Yeah? I, I, yeah. I think that's a, a great project if you want to do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks so much. But that's, uh, I think that what you say is true. Um, about power yeah. and the lack thereof. Yeah. It said something already about Nishida's stance towards the world. Yeah. And that's why I think, um, well, his philosophy presents one type of paradigm in which cooperation, reconciliation, that kind of thing becomes the principle. So to Power always means kind of domination of the weaker, or doesn't it mean that? And no, I don't mean it just in this negative sense. Also in the sense of the power of that which opposes the, the like the, um, the um, suppressing uh, generality or something like that. So it's oh, just power in, in that positive sense also. also. That's interesting. Because of the, the, the dialectical relation is a description at the ontological level, right? It's this, um, the, the power in the sense we normally um, talk about in the political philosophy yeah, yeah. is... Okay. A, a power, I think, is in, in Nishida individuality, ko, koko. So each individual is irredu irreducible. You cannot negate. And somehow it is like a Huayan Jijimuge worldview, right? That are individuals, 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 and then principles and so on, but nothing gets crashed on account of the other. And by, you know, bumping into the other, it's the very definition of being an individual. And if you, if you don't have this power inside, you cannot <coughs> maintain that individuality. So in that sense, I think power is present in that sense, the agency. And then the, that's why he wanted to create a new order in the political philosophy. Do you remember that? Ching, 
Ah, just don't get me into this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so in that, I think his idea was how to make a global world where all the countries, all the cultures can participate and create a richer reality, as opposed to somehow one dominates the other, which is another form, you know, that, that's going on. So I do feel that Nishida has some sort of paradigm there, if you look differently. Yeah, As okay. The power is yeah. in the individual. And each has the power in that sense. Whether it's fully developed or not is another sense. In, in, in the, the, the politi political philosophy, that, that way of describing power still belongs to the dominant discourse, yeah? To say, uh, yeah. Yes, um, then the, uh, if you are already crushed, you. No, 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 no. Yeah? No, no. Because power is like a will to life. Yeah. And if you lose it, we say goodbye to the world. I mean, we are free to do that too. I'm not saying power is something like a Nietzsche. I'm not, you know, Nietzsche I used to say that when he was younger, but I think he changed his mind a little bit on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I feel that somehow, so long as we are alive, we are left to be. Mm -hmm. Somehow it comes in and out, it's the breath. Mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. how I understand the absolute uh, contradictory self-identity, because you in inhale, and then you have to exhale, and then you inhale, and absolute opposite of the world and I and the seeing and thinking all come together constantly. And that's one, another way of understanding uh, these uh, words, and that's why Nishida study is very recognized in a way, right? Because you, you can in interpret him in a very different way. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Next question. Yeah. Um thank you for the paper. I think it's uh, the perfect paper and it's confidence with Oh that's that's good. Thank you very much. I'm I belong to that group of people who don't like very much about Yeah, so, a bit so Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you do have, have this. Um, the third and the first person difference, in that sense, is um, almost like a moment within um, your own self. But then I'm still within my own self. And you are just yeah. within my own self, in which case I never get to a truly transpersonal. Okay. Um, we are already truly transpersonal. The, the supposed um, mindness of the the self, the first first person, is it's not like a fishbowl, but it's like an entry point in the into the world. Um, but it's also the same entry point when one theorizes. Yeah, so it's 
the third person that sees the world at the same time. So you have not left yourself in that process. And what mediates it is the analytic tools of philosophy or thought processes or maybe categories that you use. The categories that you use, philosophical categories and concepts that you use enables you to move through these different standpoints. But in fact, you have never left the original opening in which this theorizing occurs. So language, culture is yeah. not it is, yeah. Um, it is a mediating tool, a powerful one, because it allows us to build a model and to understand the messy content into a structure as perhaps an object, yeah, to your theoretical point of view. But this theoretical point of view is actually not God's point of view or bird's point of view. We're not birds. We are thinking subjects, yeah? Thinking, not subjects, that's to the uh, Cartesian. Um, thinking selves that are embodied in the present. So we actually never left this um, embodied presence of the eternal now. And um, maybe it's too self-enclosing to call that first first person. Um, it's like hmm, the yeah. It's we lack uh, words, but in fact, the theoretical theorizer who theorizes the whole historical world, the culture, the development, and the self in my immediate opening are the same. So it's a different mode, if you will, or the different activities that it's engaged in that produces different meaning objects. And um, um, you have to be very, yeah, one has to be very careful in this, yeah, the, the ontologically speaking, what is what and what belongs where. But um, um, I don't know if you do lots of religious studies uh, readings or um, yeah, if you're a Buddhist uh, scholar um, or Nishida scholar, you, you get trained in shifting standpoints to uh, sort of navigate. But um, um, how do I get from my first first person to the theoretical third person self? Well, you are already, you already got there. Yeah, um, It's a um, question of whether you, at this moment, is a theoretical um, theory producer self or um, experientially grounded self. Um, see, these are shifts in your um, self-perception, um, if you will. It's not perception because it's not in the psychological self, but it's a different ways of noticing how you are engaged. And sometimes you can, and you necessarily do, take a third person or objectifying standpoint. And um, our language and our um, philosophical tools enable you to do that. Yeah. We'll still be, I think we first, we first go on with the other questions and then <laughs> uh, we come back. But it, it, yeah, yeah, thank uh, you, thank you, thank you. Back to what yep. is going on here. Okay, very short. Because uh, in Nishida, um, dialectical world has four, at least four dimensions, mm. if I may, as a world, totality, mm. we are all on the globe. Mm. Another uh, aspect is that we are, each one is a constitutive many of the one. Yeah. So in that sense, uh, the, we are the third, we, each one is a he, she, it, the third person. And then we are a creative self, and then uh, we are aware. Mm -hmm. so, yeah? so I think there are different uh, aspects, and you take the many and one as a perspective one, and then uh, I think the world and the individual <coughs> as the other. And then when they, uh, you can get a kind of interesting diagram there, and then uh, based on that, it, it can be explained how one becomes one of the many. And he does talk about it constitutive element of the world. And that's how history, we make history. <coughs> we are not just an individual alone. Yeah. 
And then immediately, we see, we constantly change our perspectives. So when I see you, I'm already losing myself, and I'm seeing the world. And I am, in a sense, a constitutive element of this world. And, and, and I think Mishima has actually God's bird's eye perspective. When he starts to talk about uh, the constitutive elements and so on, yeah. somehow he assumes that position, it feels to me. Yeah. And also theory making self is still a creative self. Yeah. So I don't think we can split that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, you, you too. Uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And so when he talk about say rather evolutionary evolutionary theory in the later in the, in his later works, mm -hmm. I wonder whether his theory can explain why he could achieve such theory to okay, although we are in the including including Nishida, although we are in the world, yeah. but we can look up. Yeah, yeah. That that's like when he talks about the perfect map of England. Yeah, if you want to draw a perfect map of England, then the one who draws the perfect map of England must already be in the drawing. But who draws that? Yeah, because that drawer has to be in the picture if it's a perfect <coughs> picture of England. Yeah. So it's it's like this. Yeah. In theory, is an opening. Um, that necessarily follows in the moment of reflection. But again, that's not the final story, right? That's, that's, um, you can always step back to comprehend this paradox, if you will. Yeah? But that comprehension of the paradox is itself actually already described in that theory. Yeah? See, that's a very interesting thing. But um, I don't think that's unique to Nishida. But Nishida certainly has this Escher-like uh, moment in which the drawn one is already the drawer. That's the other way around. The drawer is already the drawn one. Yeah? So the theorizer, the third perspective, like um, theorizer, who is Nishida, who's writing these things, and we are reading this and analyzing this, we are thrown into this theoretical, the, the um, standpoint of the theorizer. Yeah? But in fact, it's self-referential so that you are this being described at the same time. Yeah. Right. And, and my, this is my last question. Um, uh, whether can we take a responsibility in our action? Because, yeah, I, I mean, this, yeah, this part, um, I mean, responsibility in the sense of um, y you are making decisions, yeah? As a, don't don't take it too uh, heavy because yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't want to be held responsible. Yeah, that's a follow. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> that's um, follows. Yeah. 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 At all times, actually, we don't have any choice. A self as a, like an Aristotelian self or um, a self in virtual ethics where 
you narrate yourself in this way or that way, that becomes who you are, how you are going to be, and you pick and choose yeah, what's your narration, yeah, what's your historical self, what kind of a person are you going to be. Yeah, in this process, um, you make decisions, and many times not even conscious decisions. But um, nevertheless, they don't come out of nowhere and you're not an automaton, right? So that um, you are implicitly or explicitly in this narrating process in which you give content to who you are going to become. Yeah? So, uh, you, I mean, it's like Sartre, right? I mean, you could decide not to choose, but that too is a choice. Yeah? Um, yeah. Um, sorry, um, Nihongo demo, no, dajubu desu no de, onegai shimasu. Ato, ano, ya, zikunen of, of Deutsch, au, uh, frage stellen. Das ist auch in Ordnung. Ja. Ja, um, die letzte Frage für heute. Ja. Yeah. Wir sind schon am Ende. Uh, Lorenzo. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Nice to hear a very wide presentation. Something I was, I started wondering about as you we were giving this, uh, the, the noetic high, the noetic high, and the saying, yeah. I started wondering, is that, uh, it might be interesting, it might be, if, at least for me, because I always feel that this is very abstract. I started thinking of, of a baby, mm. of a baby human or an animal. Mm. So it's not a sort of consciousness we, we unconsciously assume when we start thinking about mm. this. And so how would, how, would it be useful, I mean, thinking also of acting intuition of development in a historical world, which is a, as this is now, as mm. we a sense of progression so the island and relationship yeah. could be very well observed in this uh, sense of uh, paradoxical unity difference in yeah. the relationship in, in mammals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not yeah. Heard of. And so could it be useful to think there's a perspective in terms of maybe with Lacan or Piaget? So yeah. there, this, develop, this development, mm. which it all seems to always be thinking in terms of history, mm. it's mm -hmm. also the history of uh, Mm -hmm. That's uh, that would be a great, great uh, critique, I think. Yeah. Does ever does Nietzsche ever thinks? Does ever does Nietzsche ever think in terms of a child? You know what? Um, I do a lot of feminism, and that would be my critical point against Nishida. Yeah. Um, his understanding is still very much of um, sort of a traditional um, self generating self. But sick people, babies, people who are completely uh, oppressed, um, I mean, they can't get to this subjectivity, yeah? Or they don't have it yet. Or, yeah, I mean, I have two boys, and then I really learned from this process. Not all subjects are subjects, yeah? They are completely vulnerable, and completely dependent, and completely not at your mercy, if you will, yeah? So uh, it's like the adult theory of interdependence and self-making, yeah, it's all good, but you know, that's not what the world is like. Yeah, the world is full of babies and people who, yeah, so it's, it's true. I mean, I even have a dog, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that makes you humble, right? So it's like, yeah, what, what is he talking about, yeah? Yeah, so. <laughs> I mean, I try to do good, right? I mean, it's as if I really like Nishida, yeah? yeah. I have 10,000 criticisms, too, yeah, that I didn't go into today, yeah. Yeah, thank yeah, you so much. Thank, yeah. Once again, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much.